As a child, I've always been fascinated by unexplored places. It seemed incredible to me that in the 21st century, there were still so many places on this planet never visited by humankind. Some were too far away, too difficult to access, or just too extreme. Even today, there are so many fascinating places left to explore. The Ivindo National Park in Gabon is one of them. Giuseppe Vassallo was an environmentalist icon in Gabon. In the 1980s, this entrepreneur owned one of the largest carpet and flooring companies in Italy. But when he learned that the floorboards he was selling were, not too long ago, large, majestic African trees, he quit his job and committed himself full-time to ecotourism and conservation in Ivindo National Park. Whenever he could, Giuseppe Vassallo tried to block corporations from destroying primary forest in Gabon. In 1994, he worked with the Gabonese government to prevent the Rugir Timber Company from continuing to destroy Gabonese rainforest. In 1999, the Gabonese government invited him to create a foundation dedicated to the protection of primary forests within this region. This was a continuation of the NGO brain forest that he helped develop. Unfortunately, a few months later, Giuseppe Vassallo was killed in a road accident in Milan and never got to see the true fruits of his labor. The foundation has important conservation value and also social value. It hires many local staff to guide and to protect this habitat. It also built a local school and brought electricity to the village of Loa Loa to preserve and protect 120 square kilometers of forest at the Kangu Falls. Life in villages like Lua Lua is very Spartan. Oftentimes, electricity is the only sign of modernity. Each day, families can spend hours transporting water from wells back to their homes. Spend just one day in a village like Lua Lua, and it becomes crystal clear that in the privileged world, there is so much that we take for granted and waste. It's quite common to see little monkeys, such as Circus Cebus and Vervets, prance mischievously around the village from one hut to the next. Villagers captured them from surrounding forests and tamed them over time. Getting to the Kangu Falls is not easy. It's in the heart of Ivindo Park. To get there, you need to take the train from the capital Libreville to the town of Bouë. From there, you hop on a collective taxi bruce to Mukoko. There, the IRET Research Center offers an excellent stopping point before entering the forest. It is a place to fuel up and gather energy before crossing numerous rivers full of rapids and circuitous loops. Exploring this park is high risk, high reward. No team has ever chronicled the species living within it, and there might be many that are new to science. And all we have are tiny little boats called Pirogé, with which we aim to traverse the many rapids 
that stand before us and Kongu Falls. The success of our mission is due to the local guides of the Foundation Internationale Gabon Ecotourism. The confidence and comfort with which they explored these forests was truly spellbinding. Because of them, we explored the biodiversity of the land and not the bottom of some river, which was definitely a concern when crossing some of these rapids. There's great hope that in these forests, there are many species still waiting to be discovered. While these mystery creatures are completely unknown to the rest of the world, in these local areas, they may have names and even be sold in the markets of villages. In fact, just recently, new species of chameleon and tarsier were discovered in these village markets. The ichthyofauna of the Ivindo and Gigi rivers, which cross the park, has only partially been studied. But from what is known, the diversity is simply amazing. It is a remarkable example of adaptive radiation. The park's invertebrates and microorganisms are almost completely unclassified. Surprising discoveries even await for terrestrial vertebrates. Some of the species living in Evindo Park are among the rarest on the planet. Have a good day exploring, and you might just find a rhinoceros viper, a mysterious forest bird Bradipurus grandis, the Congo otter, the western lowland gorilla, and the pygmy elephant. Imagine this, 600 species of diurnal butterflies, each a different color of the rainbow, live in this park. It is believed that no other region contains such a staggering diversity of diurnal butterflies. And it is right here, next to the water made dark by the tannins that the river collects from the forest, that Figet set up a camp to welcome the truly adventurous ecotourists. Evindo National Park is part of one of the largest continuous rainforests in Africa, which runs through the Congo Basin. But local geographic effects have made life within Evindo quite peculiar. The Figet camp is the last human outpost before plunging into the green abyss. The park was established in 2002 by then President Omar Bongo. This far-sighted prime minister set up 13 of Gabon's current national parks. Bongo was inspired to action from Mike Fay who had just finished his project called Megatransect, in which he crossed 2,000 kilometers of forest from Congo to Gabon, all on foot, in order to reveal the absolute beauty and diversity of these places to the rest of the world. As you remember, Giuseppe Vassallo fought hard to reduce these threats in the 1990s. In 98, they limited forest concessions to tropical wood multinational Rougier. They also agreed on sustainable management principles and the intensification of anti-poaching controls. Because of these measures, anthropic pressures in the park have subsided and life as a result has flourished. But there is now interest, mainly from Chinese energy companies, to resume natural resource extraction from the park, starting with one of its most precious pearls, Kongu Falls. This ecotourism camp acts as a deterrent against plans that would destroy the forest, including a hydroelectric power plant, the expansion of forest concessions and poaching. 
For 20 years, this garrison of stilts, equipped with some wooden beds, mosquito nets, and room for about a dozen tourists, was enough to ensure the conservation of the surrounding waterfalls and forest. Over time, though, the number of visitors coming to this camp has gone down year after year. This is due to a combination of factors, including the difficulty reaching the park, obtaining a visa for Gabon, the unstable social and political situations in Central Africa, as well as cyclical epidemics like Ebola, which hit the country and its gorillas in 2006. With less and less people coming to this camp, the threats that originally jeopardized this forest are starting to come back. Apart from Faye's expedition, Evindo has remained mainly unexplored since it was protected in 2002. In every square meter of these forests, dozens of different tree species emerge. And among the dense foliage, even colorful toucans can become quite cryptic. Amphibians and monkeys, orchids and epiphytes, easily escape detection behind the impenetrable vegetation. Guy Roger, the former poacher accompanying me on the trip, knows the sounds of these animals perfectly. He can imitate them and speak to them in order to inform them of our presence and calm them down. Despite the park's protection, we come across numerous signs of poaching. Skulls and bones of elephants missing their tusks lie on the ground across our trail. Poaching is still a problem here, even though many poachers have since repented and turned into nature guides. It's still a practice that happens within this park. To save these waterfalls and lush forests, the best defense seems to be the presence of tourists and researchers. We would take this route on our journey, but we didn't know what it would bring. Even the all-knowing Google Maps had nothing for this region. And if we needed help, the nearest villages were 60 to 70 kilometers away and reachable only by foot. The creatures that scared us the most came in a range of sizes. There were the tiny but deadly insects, the cryptic but very poisonous black mambas, and also the enormous and unpredictable forest elephants. The logistics of this mission were tough. We were walking over 150 kilometers through wetlands and humid forests without ever sleeping in the same place twice. All of our food, clothing, and equipment, well, that was going on our backs. There was no other way. Preparing the temporary camp for the night before it becomes dark is a priority and requires meticulous choices to ensure a good night's sleep before resuming walking the next day, and then the day after that, and then the day after that, and then the day after that. We walked no less than 10 kilometers a day and slept every night in hammocks. We hiked through torrential rainstorms and spent nights kept awake by the cacophonous screams of monkeys. Thank <laughs> you.
Accompanying me in this exploration was a former poacher, who is now a great connoisseur of the forest. He was hired by the park thanks to an intermediary of the Figuet. We also went with a man who's a master with a machete, as well as two porters and a photographer. The fire for cooking was lit with flint, which wasn't always easy when it was wet outside. In those cases, we had camping gas stoves. We enter under a thick and dark canopy, following the paths traced by elephants in between lianas and giant buttresses of trees that reach 50 meters high. We ford the Gigi River on a pirogé built by the park's guides with a few strokes of the machete. This stream is sinuous and rich in species unknown to science. Small alligators, aquatic snakes, iguanas, ibis, kingfishers, palm vultures, antelopes that are locally called syphilophs, and giant river otters all accompany us on our journey. There were so many surprises on our journey. We would push through an entanglement of lianas, climb over a giant trunk, only to discover new streams and waterfalls that were not even marked on the detailed French military maps. Reducing the weight of food was not always easy and definitely not always tasty. We're talking freeze-dried rice, dried and dehydrated fruit, wild mushrooms, and some lucky fishing. It was from these sources that we got the energy to fuel the exploration. It was a difficult balance, bringing the necessary food and equipment for a month of travel while still packing light enough to walk every day, 10K. Therefore, it was necessary to reduce the weight and volume of everything else. Even after this, our backpack still weighed between 20 and 30 kilos. Tranquilizing bush pigs is a matter of technique. One leaf is enough to produce the right sound. Giant lianas embrace the majestic trees of this forest. Looking at the map, we see a hill, which could make for a great stopping point, as it could be less humid and much cooler. To reach it though, we would need to cross more swamps, muddy marshes, and carpets of soggy leaves and colored mushrooms, studded with termite mounds of the most magnificent architectures.
pots, plates, and cutlery were all reduced to a minimum. All of them could occupy no more space than a shoebox. Screaming chimpanzees and very agile little monkeys follow us, monitoring our movements from the tops of the foliage. During the journey, one never ceases to be amazed. A big male chimpanzee informed us that he's monitoring this forest in our trip. With his short but impressive performance, we clearly understand that it is better to choose another path. Despite this protection, several threats are compromising life within this park. Poaching, deforestation, and dam construction have gnawed on the territories and decreased wildlife populations. Hippopotami were once abundant in the river that gives the park its name. Now, there are less than a dozen individuals swimming in these waters. The sweet fruits of these tropical forest trees often grow on the trunk to encourage the collection by animals walking on the forest floor and also by thirsty and hungry explorers. After days of walking, you get the impression that crossing even the simplest of streams requires an immense effort. The feet, always completely wet, seem to move alone, just by inertia. And that's not all. Get distracted for just one moment, and the food in the pots is attacked by ravenous ants.
And just when you think carrying food for a month on your back between the mud and the huge roots is the hard part, think again. It's actually finding drinking water after sweating with 28 Celsius temperatures and 85% humidity. Despite all the rivers and ubiquitous streams, finding suitable drinking water becomes a task within a task. Sometimes we even end up filtering and disinfecting what remains in the bush pig pools. It is not exactly what you would call refreshing. Finally, the long-awaited hill. Openings in the forest canopy and some clearings allow us to look at the sky for the first time after almost three weeks of continuous walking. The vegetation on this relief is different and makes us understand that we are not very far away from the bay where the great herbivores gather. When you spend enough time in the forest, you begin to understand it. You perceive the intricate network that connects all elements. And when you feel this sense of harmony, you think that nothing can bother you. Incredibly, it's only when you're days away from civilization, far from anything you grew up with or believed, or deluded yourself to have once known, you find true peace. When we learned that companies were aggressively moving to own and destroy parts of this forest, we knew that it was time to act. After months of meetings together with the Figet Foundation, we put together a plan. The plan was to give this forest a voice, to tell the world, and especially those who rub their hands at the idea of making a profit from one of the last virgin forests on earth, that Evindo is not abandoned, it is not remote and alone, and that there are many people from the local to global level that will fight to protect this land. For this exploration, we chose to sleep in hammocks covered by tarps instead of tents. The tarps also served as very necessary ponchos for the thundering rains that mainly happened at night. The Bay of Langue is a remote and truly exceptional place to observe groups of gorillas, bongos, bush pigs, and elephants. Some old structures built by the Wildlife Conservation Society shelter us from heavy rain at night. The next day, the bay is populated 
by hundreds of animals. The animals cool off, drink, and play in the quiet of the bay. As in a sort of dance, the gorillas in the distance emerge from the high vegetation that they feed on. The elephants and bush pigs retreat to the dense forest to spend the night. The following morning we leave the camp and it comforts us to resume the journey that will take us out of the park. Other magnificent discoveries await us, like the colorful fruits and bright waterfalls that lie amongst the vegetation. On the other hand, we understand that we are almost at the end of our exploration. The vegetation is starting to become more rarefied, and many trees seem to have been cut by man. This human-managed forest is very different from the virgin forests that we have so far encountered. Seeing this difference is heartbreaking because it puts into perspective what we have to lose. Drawn in by the roads opened by the loggers are the bees of sweat. These animals are simply tortuous. They tormented us more than the leeches or the worms of the feet hidden in the marshes. It was an elephant who stops our last steps. We must be careful and inform him of our presence, but that intruder seems almost like a gate to our exit, a passageway out of this unique and unforgettable place. The elephant at the edge of the forest gave us the time to reflect on the journey we had and what we were leaving behind as we returned to our lives in the city. After almost a month's walk away from any form of civilization, we re-emerge. We're healthy and safe, with some wounds, but nothing major. We stand almost 200 kilometers further south, in the village of Muyabi, where, near a ghost train station, a train will come to bring us back to Makoku. Near the station, we see huge logs laying in the dozens on the ground. They remind us why we decided to undertake this long and arduous journey. We want to document the beauty and importance of these primary forests 
which are now being cut at unsustainable rhythms. And this pattern is destroying the ecosystem and its wildlife. Je m'appelle Teka Teka Raymond, guide de la FIGET, Fondation Internationale Gabon Tourisme. Je vous invite à venir passer les bons moments avec nous dans les chutes de Congo et faire des tours en forêt. Euh, venez parce que. Ah, je m'appelle M. Koubafé Guy ancien guide à la Fijette, Fondation Gabon Écotourisme. Et aujourd'hui, je suis euh, Kougar. Je, 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 je fais appel à tout le monde. Ah. Ok, on y va. Oui, un accueil chaleureux vous attend. Ok. C'est bon. Ok. Bon, je m'appelle M. Koubapé Guy Roger. Euh, je suis un ancien guide de la Fijette. Et aujourd'hui, je suis euh, Nikoga, patron de Libino. Euh, je fais appel à tout le monde, tous les, les gens qui aiment la forêt, de venir visiter le parc de la Fijette de Libino et euh, la fondation Gabon et Tourisme du Gabon qui est basé à Mabopo. <rire> Un accueil chaleureux vous est réservé. Venez et vous ne serez pas déçus. The hope is that our exploration and this film will reach many people and connect them to the beauty, fragility and importance of this forest and its brothers and sisters throughout Africa and the rest of the world. It is through our appreciation of these forests that we will dull the chainsaw of the logger and take away the gun of the poacher in order to protect these habitats. In this way, we will protect the life in this forest for generations to come. We will be able to forever see the dances of the vervets, hear the songs of the different birds, lock eyes with the elephants and gorillas and continue in deep harmony with nature. <laughs> <laughs>